Hi there, and welcome to the podcast, Life as a, a show intently focused on exploring and unearthing the details of professions and the people behind them. I'm your host, Christopher Schoenwald. There haven't been too many buzzier words as of late within the sphere of environmental conservation and protection than, say, sustainability. And for good reason, of course. The challenges we all face as humans from our frightful mismanagement of the environment have never been greater. We need not look any further than the rising number of ferocious natural disasters which have been wreaking havoc in nearly every corner of the planet as of late. Such calamities have been experienced without discrimination, with nations both wealthy and poor feeling this wrath. The reasons are complex and sometimes strangely controversial. However, what's clear to most is that our way of life and living has brought this on. We're slowly poisoning ourselves and future generations' existence at the cost of living in the now. Now it's true, many of us feel this rage and may have even begun to take steps to consider new approaches to things such as consumerism. However, I dare say, not too many people have gone to the lengths of our guest today, who has built an entire life and career around a sustainability-minded ethos. Richard Grahan is first and foremost a humanitarian. Through this prism, he runs a Tokyo-based hybrid branding production company called Image Mill. Upon founding in 2012, it became Japan's first ethical and sustainable creative agency. As an award-winning creative director, working in advertising for over 20 years, spanning the globe from London to Johannesburg, and now in Tokyo, he provides services for some of the biggest and smallest brands in the world. His projects have taken him everywhere, from northern Japan to Mexico to the far reaches of Antarctica following polar explorers. And the common thread of it all, however, remains the same telling stories that inspire positive change and sustainable-minded living. Richard creates stories for organizations and calls what he does brand activism. In essence, his own dedicated work and passionate beliefs centered on promoting nonviolence and preventing abuse, human, animal, and environmental, have allowed him to develop genuine relationships with companies. Resultantly, brands have entrusted Richard with crafting these visions for their own initiatives. Whether his messages of sustainability and peace have been heard through speech, such as his TEDx talk on that matter, or even through his globally recognized and awarded documentary, Zan, his ideas are being heard. And with that in mind, Richard, welcome to the show. I'm really happy to have you on. Thanks, Chris. That was a great introduction. Have to try to live up to that now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's quite impressive, uh, no doubt. And uh, as part of the reasons, I'm really looking forward to to hearing what you know you can share with us today and enlighten us all on uh, some of the work that you have been doing because it is quite compelling. So, yeah. Without further ado, why don't we just jump right into it? Sure. So, yeah. Um, most people call me Rick now these days. That's kind of my new stage name. So, sure. but my, my mom and yourself still calls me Richard. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so right. anyway, so yeah, I'm from Belfast originally, Northern Ireland. Uh, you know, I've been in Japan now for, gosh, it must be like 15 years, you know, yeah. but, you know, still lost in translation. And uh, yeah, so I, I've, you know, I don't know if you want sort of more corporate background or... Well, I think maybe what we can do to start here is I have a segment called Coloring Wikipedia, which basically I just yeah, read I don't off. want to like jump into that first. So yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And then perhaps like through uh, through some discussion, a Q&A segment, we can kind of dive mm-hmm. into a little bit more of your background and, and what you've done, if that's all right. Perfect. No worries. So, so yeah, so I'm Rick Grehan and I'm from Belfast, Northern Ireland. And uh, yeah, I formed a midge mill in Japan 14 years ago. But um, sorry, I formed Image Mill, you know, about seven years ago, but came to Japan 14 years ago. Mm. And uh, so coming from Belfast, uh, I was born in 1969, which was the beginning of the, the, the modern troubles, which was basically an unrest period with England and, and Northern Ireland. 
and pretty much growing up in a, a war zone, but um, my family were very involved in peace activism. Mm. Uh, my father was one of the heads of the civil rights movements, and my oh, wow. aunt's sister was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. So, wow. so I grew up with these amazing role models, and uh, you know, from a very young age, I was an activist. You know, I had no idea what that was, but I was carrying placards, you know, stop the war, uh, you know, like you know, yeah. peace now. And, you know, very much kind of traditional old fashioned activism. And uh, so anyway, like after that, I decided to, you know, go out of Ireland and went over to England to study graphic design and got into advertising and uh, ended up working in London briefly, big corporate identity company, working on brand identity and packaging and brand strategy. Yeah. And I moved to South Africa of all places and uh, wow. there working in advertising, graphic design, art direction, creative direction. And something sort of broke in me a little bit because, you know, I, I love advertising. I love creativity and, and, and branding and creating these yeah. great stories. Yeah. But uh, I had this kind of disconnect because during my work time, you know, I've been working on brands that in my personal life, I was actually boycotting. Uh, you know, from sustainability, from, you know, an activist point of view. Mm -hmm. So I probably won't mention any, any names of brands, but uh, so I just thought, you know, as, as I say in Japan, Shogunai, you know, you have your daytime job pays the rent and then in your spare time, you can do what you love, yeah. but it started to get worse and worse. And then eventually I decided to leave South Africa and go on a kind of soul searching trip which brought me from Cape to Cairo, driving through Africa and all the way to India. And it was there that I had the kind of realization that, you know, branding, marketing, advertising, you know, I used to think it was kind of like a kind of parasitical, mm. you know, the vultures of, of consumerism, you know, right. getting people to buy stuff they don't need, kind of meaningless. But I realized there that, you know, actually you know it's really just kind of human behavior and psychology and you can actually use that those tools to to create good it's all about the intention you know yeah so then i started to try and introduce my you know philosophy into my branding and mm. it was only really once i got to japan um you know i founded my own company image mill and really started to dive into this world of sustainable branding yeah and uh you know so been struggling since then you know especially at the very beginning you know this was like probably eight years ago and uh you know japan's a little bit behind the curve with mm -hmm. sustainability and you know it's you know i always talk about why this is it's more i think Japanese love to study something and see it from all directions and mm -hmm. try not to make any mistakes, you know, because yeah. mistakes are, you know, a very bad thing here. So it ends up, you know, creating a paralysis of, you know, not being mm -hmm. able to move forward, you know, uh, really a fear of change, a fear of the unknown. Right. Yeah. So, you know, uh, so when I started Image Mill, like I had a very strict policy, right? I'm only going to work with great brands you know brands that have an environmental strategy report yeah. you know like patagonia or, or lush or any of those guys right. but unfortunately the work was very thin yeah. and you know a lot of the japanese brands seemed very interested and i you would do a lot of lectures for japanese brands but really very slow to implement so mm -hmm. i started to see my bank balance disappear very quickly yeah. and you know I always talk about there's the five C's of sustainability. And the first one is competitive. You know, you, you got to be make money. You got to yeah. as a brand, you got to, you know, that's number you gotta one. You got to be around essentially, right? To be able to. Uh, your own sustainability change. is the most yeah. important. Yeah, exactly. You know? Right. I always give an example, like you could have a, a bar of soap. I use this as my kind of basis for my TED talk, you know, kind of bar of soap save the world. You know, imagine a bar of soap when you buy it, you send a kid in Africa to school and you know all this great kind of stuff but mm -hmm. to actually really implement that you know, the bar of soap would be too expensive mm -hmm. and you know it just go out of business so first rule of sustainability is profitability you know yeah yeah mm -hmm. i hear you on that one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah so you know it's been a it's been a tough journey but um you know things have really started to catch up uh japan i think has tremendous 
possibility from being quite behind to really leapfrogging ahead because yeah. that's one of the beauties of Japan. You know, once there's a, a consensus yeah. and once people, okay, this is the right way, everybody Things will do it. You know? Yeah, you're right. Right. So I really think that's that's coming very soon, although I've been saying that for quite a few years, <laughs> but it, it's getting closer. It's definitely getting closer. I would, yeah, I would say so. I mean, like just sort of reading the tea leaves and looking around, it would seem to be, you know, I just had a guest on this show not too long ago. I mean, it was within climate tech. So it's a little bit different, of course, but she'd raised a point where investment within that whole sector has like tripled in recent years. And obviously, yeah. like the, the area that you're within too, I mean, there is certainly, you know, a trickle down effect on some of those types of, you know, investments, of course, going across that way, it's signaling a shift and a shift of mindsets, essentially, right? Towards like, yeah, yeah these, I mean, Im- these issues are important and uh, we, we better be prepared for them. And I'm assuming like that's how brands are, you know, probably positioning themselves to a certain degree and whether they're ready to do something at this particular moment could be a different matter, but I'm sure they all know within the next, I don't know, six months, 18 months, 24 months, like they really have to get their ducks in a row to, to be able to move um, and and do it the right way too. Right. I think like people are getting a little bit more, well, consumers, I would say are getting a little bit I don't know, smarter, I guess. So you can sort of distinguish between that greenwashing essentially now. And if you're not doing it the right way, they're going to call you out. And probably like even here within Japan too, which typically isn't always like that. I think the awareness levels are reaching a point where, you know, that that there's a realistic sort of possibility that brands would have to be aware of that they have to, again, be prepared to do things in the right way. I, I, again, I'm I'm just guessing. No, you're you're exactly right. And, you know, you know, maybe I sounded a bit pessimistic there, but really it's gone mainstream here. Yeah. And in, in such a way that I'm actually kind of fed up with the word sustainable. Mm. And, uh, you know, and I think in many ways it's lost its meaning. You know, yeah. it's become it's become a pillar of marketing, you know, place, mm. price. You know, it's it's now sustainability is there. So um, but still with a lot of real depth and a lot of understanding. Yeah. And for me, sustainability, is, it's almost got a kind of negative connotation mm-hmm. about reducing your impact, you know, reducing your negative impact on, on, on the planet, on people, yeah. you know, and just trying to get down and down, you know. But um, so that's why I'm kind of talking a lot now about regeneration. So, you know, I kind of say sustainability is dead long live regeneration you know i think that's the next step you know and it's all about positive impact net positive impact yeah. instead of negative and uh, you know about while doing business and while creating products you're actually creating you know a, a positive impact on environment on pe- yeah. people and i think that's the really big next step and also mm. there's such a sense of urgency now with climate change um you know and once again climate change has just been so spoken about that people are starting to kind of not really you know it, it's you know it, it was that great movie don't look up with leonardo dicaprio you know it, it yeah. really is it's so hard to understand this huge impact is coming over a really long period of time so we've been really involved in in, in climate change education yeah. Uh, we're working with 350.org, which is an amazing NGO started mm-hmm. in the US, but got a great team in Japan. So we've yeah. been creating yeah. stories uh, about climate impact in Japan because everyone mm-hmm. just thinks it's Antarctica, it's North Pole, uh, Great Barrier Reef, but it really the impact is massive here, you know, yeah. already. We see it around us. So, yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of what we do. Mm-hmm. I call it the next um, level or next generation advertising mm-hmm. because, you know, people really don't want to be sold to anymore. As you said, the consumers become very savvy now and kind of knows when they're being sold to and they don't like that. You know, they want right. brands to kind of show up in the environment where they should be and not just popping out of, you know, pop up ad banners, you know, that it's, it's yeah. destructive even. Yeah. So brands really have to sort of find their purpose and, and find meaningful ways to engage with their consumer now, you know, mm-hmm. they got to be part of their culture yeah. and not, not just target marketing from the outside. Okay. Let's target that market. They got to be part of it. 
Right. You know, and is I there a particular that, example of one of the projects or something that you've done that illustrates so, sort of those points? So you can share absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few. Um, I mean, one of my favorite brands is Patagonia. You know, um, you know, we all know them, but you know, they practice what they preach. They've been they're really in it so deep that you know everyone's yes. just kind of learning from them. So I just completely admire them. And I, mm -hmm. I've been creating content from them. So they they don't really do advertising. Yeah. What they do is they have a massive NGO support system through their 1% commitment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's granted. So they they make they give grants for films. So okay. I've been lucky to be involved in some of these filmmaking projects. Uh -huh. So good one is um pow which is protect our winters yeah and this was like a snowboarder champion who started this ngo about uh, climate change so what we do for patagonia is we create it what, what what we call ourselves is what we do at image was like brand journalism mm -hmm. yeah you know branded content was a big thing but we think the next stage is branded journalism so really that means telling the stories authentic stories about reality mm -hmm. um but in, involving the brands so we help you know well it, brands are on different stages like patagonia already have a great story so all we have yeah. to do is um for instance power we just told the story of uh, a very top snowboarder goro san and uh, so we just went up the mountain and and just hearing his philosophy and and mm. painting his picture and not talking about Patagonia. Right. You know, it's all about debranding now, we call it as well. And in fact, when I first started working with Patagonia, I was always getting the logo in the frame. Yeah. And they were afterwards they're saying, no, take that out. You know, it looks so selling or obvious. Backy almost, yeah. And, you know, and for me, that's really authentic branding. Yeah. You know, they're really... You know they're so in in that market that you know they really can just create content for the the causes yeah. and and get get the benefit from that so yeah so i've been so lucky to travel up you know up mountains and another great one is like citizen watches okay so citizen citizen watches have a a, a sort of outdoor range of watches called promaster okay and okay. uh so our, my friends at uh, the History Channel approached me because they, you know, had this idea of we work together on it. But, you know, normally for these kind of underwater watches and sky watches, they always have Olympic champions and, you know, like really high performance people. And right. uh, I, we, we thought that the real heroes are actually the the unsung heroes, the kind of you know environmentalists, the scientists who are okay. working behind okay. the scenes to kind of protect the great outdoors so that we yeah. can still enjoy them yeah. so they really loved it and we sort of started you know looking for eco heroes around the world which you know such a tough job you know i do this anyway but you know we could you know we went to uh, colorado mountains you know we did polar training with eric larson who's a very famous polar explorer and just here wow. In his story about going to the North Pole, it was actually scary, you know, because he's been going there over 17 years wow. and he's seen massive degradation in the in the ice. It's just at the beginning, he was saying it was like a desolate, cold, barren landscape. And you just literally walk and walk and walk. And yeah. it was dry because it was yeah. so cold, it was dry. But now because it's got a bit warmer, there's a lot of snow. And, uh, you know, that may sound like, oh, wow, of course, there's snow in the North Pole, but it used to be so cold there wasn't. Right. So he was saying, like, you know, the ice is breaking up. He has to swim fast stretches of it because the ice is so broken. And, wow. You know, he he kind of talks about it that he thinks in the future ice will be in a museum, you know, because he, he just sees it as, you know, it's melting faster than we can imagine, you know. Yeah. Um, I love that guy so much, you know, we ended up going to Antarctica as well with him, uh, you know, so we created this competition for the watches. Again, we're bringing the brand in authentically, mm -hmm. and, you know, people could just take photographs of their watch in a very adventurous situation. And we picked yeah. five winners from around the world, brought them to Antarctica on an expedition with Eric Larson. Oh, wow. And of course, we were, it was our filming. And what really struck me the most is it was in the, the Antarctica Peninsula. And mm -hmm. while we were there, there was a record hottest day ever recorded in the peninsula. 
And I mean, I had all this great Patagonia gear and, you know, I was taking it off. It was so hot. I mean, it was still chilly, right? But it wasn't but all the same, yeah. Temperatures, I mean, you know, you shouldn't be doing and that I'm, in Antarctica. I'm guessing. Incredible. Or at least yeah, and I mean, years ago. I saw like these beautiful penguins, and the babies were kind of lying on the rock, and it looked kind of comical. And I was kind of laughing. And then the one of the scientists is with us was going, actually, it's because the baby's overheating, uh, you know, because you know, because they have very like thick fur to help yeah, them yeah. through the winter, right. and they're lying on the rock just trying to like disperse the heat and. You know, it's it's kind of heartbreaking. So yeah. it's a great campaign. So we literally create a website for this and then uh, do little documentary films. And um, we have product placements. So they are wearing the watches. And, um, you know, we we do, the, you know, we have to connect the brand in an right. authentic way. Right. And then they donate also a percentage of the watch sales to these causes. And, and you know, so it's a really great win-win situation. Mm -hmm. We went to Great Barrier Reef. But because of all this, I've really witnessed firsthand the impact of climate change and it's devastating. You know, I've been diving in the ocean with whale sharks in Indonesia filming and, you know, the plankton levels yeah. have been dropping dramatically because of the plankton lives on the surface of the ocean. And that's it's where they're heating, heating up. up. And it's only like small heating up, but it's enough to create this big impact, you know? So yeah, yeah, it's, you know, and diving in the Great Barrier Reef, one of the dreams since I was a child, Yeah, I, we couldn't find a patch. That yeah, I mean, that, that has by, been well-documented is almost falling off the map essentially, right? You no, know, you, but you hear about this, right? But, you know, you mm -hmm. always think, ah, it's massive because it's as right. big as Japan. You yeah. know, the coral, the coral reef is as long as Japan. Yeah. But it's it's really decimated you know and it's only going to get worse yeah and i think i mean just the, what you've been describing the last few minutes here i mean you have such a unique perspective aside from one being plugged into all this knowledge and being aware of it and having a passion towards it but also like you just as you mentioned you've been around the world seeing it experiencing mm -hmm. it speaking yeah. to others as well who have been up close and personal with it I mean, that hits home, I think, a lot differently than what it does to say someone, someone like myself who does care about all of these issues, but we've never been in a position to necessarily take all of it and take all of it in much like you, you have, at least. And it's, it's really, must, it's really hard yeah. to come by, you know, and yeah. you know, also myself, I've been an activist and, you know, I really knew it in theory. Yeah. And I think that's the problem with, with mankind, you know, mm -hmm. unless they experience pain firsthand, they don't really react. Right. So I just hope it doesn't get to such a stage where, you know, climate change is irreversible. Yeah. And yeah. before well, we really mm -hmm. realize. Mm -hmm. Well, you did bring up a, a point that I was going to ask about anyway, and I kind of would like to return to that. It was in reference to that Netflix film, Don't Look Up the uh, DiCaprio film, basically a satirical film uh, for those who haven't seen it. I'm sure most people are familiar with it at this point, but basically this giant asteroid is pummeling towards Earth and the reactions of the characters in the movie. Of course, you have scientists that are jumping up and down, you know, um, politicians, corporations, you know, are either ignoring it or finding, trying to find out ways to exploit our impending disaster, <laughs> destruction of our species as we see it. Now, I mean, that film was enjoyable on a number of different levels, but also at the same time, it hit home in a different sort of way. And even for myself in, in watching it probably, you know, several months ago, it still sort of like sits with me in a funny way. Um, and like it, it, it hit me. And uh, for somebody like yourself, again, drawing reference to everything that you've done and your roots in activism, what was your impression of that film itself? I mean, it's very polarizing that film, you know, was, like, yeah. you know, a lot of people hate it and think it was very, you know, like kind of not deep, but, you know, for me, it was perfect. It was yeah, like, me too. Such, yeah. it was such, you know, it really hit me home as well. It was, you know, very clever, mm -hmm. you know, it looked satirical and comic, but all these things that we were laughing at or think it's ridiculous really are based in re re reality, you know? Yeah. And we see it all the time, you know, and, you know, even recently there, there was little um, activist on television in, in the UK, right? That. Yeah. And yeah. they were just drawing the comparison and, and yes, you know, people just don't want to deal with this situation. And, you know, it was actually quite amazing that, that so many people didn't realize the movie was about climate change. <laughs> which is clever you know because you yeah. know once i tell them it's like 
oh, oh gosh, that, you know, realization. So it's very clever, I think, you know. Clever or sad? I'm not sure. I'm kind of, you know, my, I'm divided on that point. I'm not entirely sure, you know, how people are missing that point. But yeah, all the same, I hear you on that. I mean, it's extremely hard to change behavior, you know, um, you know, that's, that's why branding is so powerful, you know, that's, you know, we grew up eating Kellogg's cornflakes because our mothers bought it and we, we kind of, you know, invest ourselves in these brands due to just our historical, you know, personal preferences, you know, so it's yeah. very hard to break these patterns, you know, Agreed. so, you know, and that's why I'm using the branding techniques against themselves, you know, to try to just mm -hmm. change the message, change the narrative. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically psychological warfare going on here, you know, between <laughs> it's an interesting way the, of looking you know, at the power, it, yeah. the powers to be, and, you know, the, the, the old, you know, fossil fuel industries, et cetera, against, yeah. Yeah. against us, you know, it reminds me of the smoking campaign, you know, like, you know, how long the smoking industry fought, you know, tooth and nail just to kind of keep the profits sure. going as long as possible, you know, yeah. and that's what's happening now with the fossil fuel industry, you know, because even they're accepting that, you know, there's, you know, there's only a certain amount of time left and they're investing in renewable energy, right. you know, but they're still milking it as long as possible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would also seem that of course, I mean, we've been focusing a lot, I'd say, on some of the, the things that are a little bit discouraging, you know, to be honest, um, with climate change and everything that's going on, some attitudes and, and, and everything towards it. But I think also on the flip side, I mean, there has been some encouraging news as well. Um, again, making reference to a guest that I had on not too long ago uh, with a distinct background within, you know, climate tech. Um, she was saying that one of the reasons for optimism for her in particular was that, you know, a child who say maybe seven, eight years old would probably at, in this generation would be able to tell you a lot more about say climate change than perhaps you or I, when we were that age, you know, and that, that, that unto itself has got to be a reason for optimism. I would say yeah. those children growing up are going to be demanding more. And even you can see that too. in like even the, the 20 somethings, you know, right now, I think their interests, you know, not all of course, but some are, you know, again, using social media to call out brands, to call out individuals, to call out each other <laughs> yeah. for better or for worse at times about some of these actions. And I mean, that unto itself has got to be encouraging to a degree. Now, here's my question to you, Rick. Um, in terms of all this, I guess, um, I don't know. Do you think, hmm, I'm losing my train of thought here, but um, do you think, part of this change, this reason for change within youth has been, I guess, some of the work that like people like you have been doing, which has been shifting attitudes, or do you think it has to do more with like some of these, you know, catastrophes basically landing on our doorsteps you know, on a near daily basis or in other parts of the world that it's becoming harder and harder to ignore? Like, what do you think, and this is the question I'm after is like, what do you think the reason for some of this positive change? Like, why has it been coming about? Yeah, so I mean, absolutely, you know, you, you can get burnt out uh, thinking about all this and, and the mm -hmm. negativity, but, you know, the positive is really there and probably more so than the negative. It just seems negative gets better news all the time. So, right. and, and you're totally right, you know, the, the, the millennials or even, well, Gen Zs are, are yeah. really worrying for brands, like brands are really like panicking because, this new generation is coming through is way more inf informed yeah, you know, and, and way more opinionated, you know, and I think what's happening, you know, in the past, you know, society, because I think when I was 14, I became vegetarian and I was very active, but then you get caught in this education cycle and, you know, and preparing for business and work. And, you know, I think that that's breaking down mm -hmm. and, you know, I think it's, hard to do with you know flow of, of information and you know just the breaking down of corporate structure and the you know like just technology is really kind of liberating people in many ways communication yeah. internet you know the new new ways to make money you know and i always i always talk about this you know like you know how you know how to get started you know is to do what you love and you know not what you know 
back in the past, we often gave up our dreams because, you know, we, you know, we were brainwashed that you have to be a doctor or a businessman or whatever right. else. And, you know, I think that's kind of losing its power, you know, mm. and there's a lot of great examples out there. And, you know, especially in Japan too, you know, the youth never were engaged. When I first arrived in Japan, youth never talked about politics didn't yeah. know anything about it the young people these days are so passionate so knowledgeable mm -hmm. they're not they're not listening anymore you know and mm -hmm. uh, you know like people like Greta Thunberg has just kind of been such a great role model yeah. there's a Friday for Futures group in fact there's many of them in Japan each each city has got like a Fridays for Future group hmm. and uh, you know and I, I've been working with them and it's just a bunch of school kids and oh my god you know just the way they they talk they're so articulate Hmm. you know they're so informed you know they're they're so passionate you know yeah. so i have really you know definitely got kind of you know hope in mm -hmm. the future i think us older people are it's very hard for us to change yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so i think you know you're well so long story short going around in circles there but i really do think it is you know good brands have emerged you know and mm -hmm. you know it used to be that you know with production cycles and production kind of uh you know the way of production like only big investment was necessary to be able to create products yeah. etc so technology has just allowed you know crowdfunding and, and all these different wonderful things has allowed good ideas to come through stronger yeah and creativity you know it used to be just you know money yeah now it's it's you know creativity is the most important thing i think mm -hmm. in, on the planet mm -hmm. Mm. you know and where before it was just who the person had the had the bucks you know right so so yeah really positive and and seeing great stuff you know we're really engaged with young people in japan and it's inspiring for me i'm learning mm. from them it's amazing mm. you know that's the way it should be right yeah. that's exactly yeah. the way it should be exactly, yeah. excellent yeah. okay well it's kind of a, an interesting point i mean where we've had i think we've had a discussion now where we have focused on some of the concerning issues and we also had reasons for optimism maybe we could close out with this last question here in terms of i don't know in terms of all of this putting it all together you know how optimistic are you moving forward considering issues i mean i'm not going to use the word sustainability i know yeah. <laughs> regeneration maybe we can go with that one yeah um so somehow i'm like i mean i'm full of hope you know yeah. always i don't think you, you could keep working in this kind of industry if you if you didn't have that hope yeah. a lot of people try to you know a lot of people who see it as a potential you know good business you know a money-making opportunity don't last mm. because you got to be passionate about it. And, um, you know, I'm so full of hope and, you know, I really see big changes, you know, um, mm -hmm. I see a lot of, you know, people who are, you know, starting NGOs, starting businesses and ethical brands doing really well. And, uh, you know, massive, even the shoshas now are starting to approach people I know mm -hmm. because they realize they're so far behind and they, and they have to catch up with sustainability. So they're reaching yeah. out, they're planning, there's like a lot of, you know, social media platforms being created, you know, for sustainable brands. And, you know, even in these kind of like, uh, you know, fashion exhibitions, like massive parts of it are sustainability, you know, focused. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've been working with such wonderful brands like uh, CFCL, which is a nice new brand to the uh, head of Isimiyaki Man's menswear design, mm -hmm. left and started a sustainable brand. Mm. And the beauty of it is it's it's very high end, very sophisticated, very beautiful. Yeah. And I think that's the importance that, you know, sustainability used to be kind of something like compromise, giving up. But now I think it's that the lifestyle is becoming a, a really the right choice. Almost a selling know. point unto itself. In a, in a yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a it's just a better way to live. You know, like I talk a lot about reconnection, you know, so. Uh, you know, we, we've lost connection with ourselves, with our planet, you know, with our families, with each other. So mm -hmm. we, this reconnecting is starting to happen, you know, and it's it's not about giving anything up. It's about getting it all back. Yeah. You know, you know, like when we go out to a farm or something, just putting your hands in the in the mud and, you know, just becoming aware of this circus. You know, we talked about circular economy before. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really just a natural cycle and, and yeah. branding and business and mankind 
has just gone off in such a tangent and there's a disaster that they're realizing that you know nature occurs in these circular patterns for reasons because it yeah. works you know so brands have to kind of wise up and you know they're, if they don't get involved in this then they're going to be left behind you know yeah yeah well that's probably a nice way to uh, to end it um <laughs> it's been a really enjoyable discussion here today rick and i really thank you you know for one your time and then all the insights as well and some of the examples that you shared i think it really was going to hit home for a lot of people um you know brought some of these issues to the forefront and probably taught a lot of people too. I mean, you know, one for me, for example, sustainability, you know, and, and that term and where it's, how it's being interpreted by people like yourself and where it's at and perhaps maybe where we can sort of shift our attention towards some other concepts that you've introduced as well. So, yeah, I thank you for all of that. Um, it truly was only, a pleasure in that pleasure, riveting yes. conversation. So thank you. Thanks very much, man. Yeah. For those interested in learning more about Rick and his work, you can find and connect with him through his company, Image Mill. Um, and also you can find him on LinkedIn. This information, by the way, will be included in the show notes. Also today, if you like today's episode, please be share. I mean, that stuff does count and it does help spread the word. Also too, you can rate, review, and subscribe wherever you access your podcasts. Um, also too, head on over to YouTube and look for Life As A. We do have a YouTube channel there where you can see full conversations, much like the one that we had today with Rick. Um, the interesting thing too is at the start, we'll have a, a bit of a slideshow where there'll be some imagery associated with the talk where you can kind of check that out as well. And then finally, don't forget to tune in to the next episode of Life as a, where we'll continue to explore and unearth the details of professions and the people behind them. I'm your host, Christopher Schoenwald. Until next time, stay curious about life and living.